un coup de cœur. 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 Un coup de Mr. President, thank you. Before lunch, I was making this submission that numerous soldiers, military, were killed at Tulpal Tray. So you can be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt on that evidence and sure that those deaths took place, and equally sure that this was part of a central policy. I'd like next, Mr. President, to make submissions on how you, the judges, should treat the mass of pattern evidence or similar fact evidence in this case. By that I mean, how do you evidentially treat the fact that you are not just dealing with torpor trade, you're dealing with multiple killings around the country in very similar circumstances, in strikingly similar circumstances. And in my submission, when you are faced with similar fact evidence or pattern evidence, it is probative in the case. Two or more pieces of evidence become mutually supportive, they support each other. And in the face of pattern evidence, you the judges will have to ask yourselves, is this evidence of central policy or is it coincidence? In my submission, Mr. President, it is not coincidence that these killings took place within the same time period. It is not coincidence that the deaths were preceded by loudspeaker announcements. It is not coincidence that as a consistent pattern, Khmer Republic officials and military were misled. It's not coincidence that they were told on so many occasions that they were going to meet the prince. It is not coincidence that they were told they might be promoted. It is not coincidence that they were tied up in groups of 15 or 20 or more. It is not coincidence that they were killed in secret. It is not coincidence that they were taken to remote areas to be executed. That is pattern evidence and it goes to central policy. And then I want to address Nguyen Chia's command and control. Do you remember him saying, if I would known about Tool Portray, I would have investigated. Evidence of command, evidence of control. Do you seriously believe for one moment that Nguyen Chia would have investigated the mass death of his enemies? What did he say in Enemies of the People when he was told that villagers were being killed? Oh, I can't remember the exact moment. I just went on with my work. Nguyen Chia, the investigator, not possible. Now, Mr. President, I've dealt with Deutsch's testimony in case one. I want to deal with his testimony in this case, case two one, and what he had to say about party policy pre-1975. You'll recall our submissions in our closing brief and repeated by my learned colleague, Mr. Smith, about people being sent to M13 in 1973 the enemies for smashing and interrogation. Quote, Deutsch, E1, slash 50.1. They were part of the party's policies. That was the party's policy. I learned that from the party's documents. It was the party's policy. The party of these two accused. He said, and this is relevant to the Hanoi returnees, the Khmer Hanoi 
He said in E1 slash 51.1, in the connection with who were the enemies and who were M13 and who were arrested, interrogated and smashed, I quote, another group of people were those who were sent to study in Vietnam and later on arrested, close quote. So that's Doik giving testimony that Khmer, Hanoi, returnees were being executed and the defence still raised the submission that this event didn't happen and the, and the Khmer Hanoi were not executed. E1-52.1, this case, we were instructed by the party that anyone who entered the liberated zone would be considered as an enemy. And, Your Honours, why this is important is because we're not talking here about classic espionage or spying. Anyone who set foot inside a liberated zone was earmarked as an enemy. And this shows the sort of intent that you're dealing with. Still doing, still the same document. How enemies were classified according to party's policy. And he spoke of the revolutionary flag of 1973. Now, Mr. President, you don't have a revolutionary flag from 1973 on the case file. But here is Doik talking in 1973 revolutionary flag about the classification of enemies, party's policy. First, the police and the soldiers were of a special class. And then on the application of the policy, Doik said this, quote, the policy was applied the same. The same policy was that whenever the party regarded someone as an enemy, we had to smash him or her. And we had no way to contest it when the party determined a person as an enemy, we had nothing but to smash that enemy for the party. After 1975, former soldiers and officers of Lon Nol regime were the key enemies. And in the face of that, the defence want to say this is an evidence of central policy. Revolutionary flags don't disclose any offences, say the Nguyen Chia defence team. Well, it was a, an offence to label people incorrectly as spies and then to smash the spies in secret. You remember the revolutionary flag of 1973. Smashing dishonourably. The Khmer Hanoi I'm going to deal with briefly. Nguyen Chia say, oh, we can't be sure of this. It's only Nu Mao and Chuk Rin that have given evidence. It's not. I've just quoted Doik saying, Vietnamese, Khmer Hanoi, 1973, executed, M13. If this wasn't a fact that's established on the evidence, why was Ian Sari admitting in 1996 that 2,000 Khmer Hanoi returnees had been massacred? You can be absolutely sure that this took place. Nu Mao, Chuk Rin, Ying Sari, Doik, the witnesses Hedda spoke to, Professor Chandler. How many more sources of evidence do you want to make you sure that the Khmer Hanoi were executed as enemies in the mid-1970s? I want to deal quickly with Chuk Rin, because the defence want you to believe that when I was questioning him, I was on some evil mission to misconstrue things. What did he say? My question, I quote, was it during the time that you were in the liberated zone that it was common knowledge that people who lived in the cities that were not yet under Khmer control, Khmer Rouge control, were occupied by enemies? Answer, yes, it is correct. My question. I want to be absolutely clear on this. So, well before 1975, in other words, during the period 1971 to 1973, 
you as a military man knew that people who occupied the cities were enemies. Is that right? Answer, yes, it is. The defence know this is important because here we've got a military man, a military commander, saying people in the city were regarded as enemies. And they tried to come up with some idiocy, I suggest, as to what was going on with my advocacy. There's my advocacy, there's the question, there's the answer. But Chukrin was even more important because I asked him this question. Question. Who told you that the 17th of April people were considered to be with the enemy? In general, it's common sense that everyone in Cambodia would know this, even a young baby or young person, because this is was not strange to anyone. So let's just pause here. In 1973, the notion that the Khmer Rouge treat city dwellers as enemies is so well known that even a baby or a young person would be able to tell you that's how it is. I want to deal with the intention towards Prince Sihanouk. It hasn't featured much in this trial, but we're talking about the criminal intention of these two accused. Bear well in mind, please, all of you who look at these proceedings, that Nguyen Chia and Khun Son Pong were contemplating killing the prince. Killing the prince for the good of the country, killing the prince for economic policy, it's evidence of their intention. Three hundred and nine years ago, in 1605, an Englishman wrote a play. His name was William Shakespeare. The play was a tragedy called King Lear. In the play, there is a character called the Fool. But Shakespeare's Fool was not really a fool. Shakespeare's Fool was intelligent. Shakespeare's Fool was wise. Shakespeare's Fool knew how to give a good speech. I'll leave it to you, Your Honours, whether coming before this court and insulting everyone in sight is advocacy. It's not advocacy where I come from. It's not international standards. And I'll leave it for others to judge. But when you come in the courtroom and insult you, when you come in the courtroom and insult your court, when you come in the courtroom and insult all my colleagues here, when you come in the courtroom and insult the general public, when you come in the courtroom and insult the international press, and let's just add something else, let's insult the diplomats and let's insult the diplomats' wives. Please do not think this is advocacy. And I'll leave it for others to judge whether ranting like a deranged peacock is advocacy or not. I'll leave it for others to judge whether this form of so-called advocacy in fact leaves only the speaker looking like the fool. In conclusion, this, Mr. President, neither me nor any of my colleagues have been a backpacker on the riverside. We are not in an international anti-communist conspiracy to subvert justice. We're here to do our job. We're here to prosecute. We need to do it vigorously. That is our job. The defence do not like it, and of course that shows.
But Mr. President, I finish on this point. Please do not be fooled by a first-class amateur that we at the OCP are not professionals. Thank you. ដល់គេថាយើងខ្ញុំនៅខាងអូស៊ីពីនេះមិនមែនជាអ្នកមានវិជាជីវៈនោះទេសូមអរគុណសូមបញ្ចប់បាទអរគុណ <coughs> អានេះអង្គយមរដ្ឋសូមលឹកជូនភាគទីថាភាគទីនេះនៅ <coughs> ជាវាងបាននៅការនិយាយប៉ះពាល់ទៅដល់ភាគទីរទេហើយមានបានបំលឹកជម្រាបជូនភាគទីរួចហើយកាលពីលើកមុននៅនេះគឺយើងរំល
not had those uh, the defense are not, not happy about the mission of the seven but in war crimes of the scale your honors, it is never possible to bring into the courtroom each and every individual witness, and it is standard practice in international tribunals to admit and consider statements of other witnesses that corroborate the evidence you have heard in this trial. And yes, in addition to the thousands of contemporaneous records and the witness statements. The prosecution has also put before the chamber secondary material, articles and books written by individuals who research these events, reports from governments and organizations like Amnesty International. And I would emphasize here, Your Honors, one very important point that refutes the defense assertion that the prosecution is trying to limit this trial to a conventional biased account of Democratic Chia. Your Honors, it was the prosecution, the prosecution who put on the case file and introduced as evidence in this trial the writings of the authors favored by the defense, people such as Michael Vickery and William Shawcross. It is due to our efforts that this chamber has a variety of sources from all perspectives before you. We have done this, Your Honor, because every member of this prosecution team is interested in ascertaining the truth. What of the defense? When it was their turn before the start of this trial to provide you with a list of the documents that they would propose for admission, the Noon Chea defense offered you nothing. Every other party provided a list of trial documents. They refused. Your Honors, if they were not happy with the documents on the case file or those that were proposed by the co-prosecutors, they had the opportunity to propose additional documentary evidence. They chose not to do so. Another assertion we heard from the defense, from both defense teams, is that the prosecution, the prosecution is ignoring the historical period and events preceding the 17th of April, 1975. Noon Chea says we are only looking at the body of the crocodile and not its head or its tail. Kusampan says that we have treated historical context as some kind of sideshow. I'm not sure what trial they are talking about. Our closing trial brief, Your Honors, begins with 40 pages addressing in detail the events from the time period from the mid-50s right up until the evening of 16 April 1975. And I know Your Honors recall that we spent considerable time questioning every witness who appeared before this chamber on that time period. And I want, I want to explain why we did that. Because we agree with the defense that this time period is critical in this case. The reason is that the accused are charged with crimes that began at 9 a.m. on the morning of the 17th of April, 1975, and had been planned well before that. Noon Chea, Kusampan, and Pol Pot did not wake up at 7 a.m. on the 17th of April and decide to evacuate Phnom Penh. The events of that day resulted from meetings of the party leaders held in mid-74, early April 75, it resulted from a strategy of emptying out towns and cities that began in 1973, and it went as far back to party lines and policies that were initiated in the 1960s. 
Uh, so to understand why the population of Phnom Penh was forced to leave the city on the 17th of April and who was responsible for that decision, we must turn to the pre-75, pre-April 75 evidence. We have done exactly that, Your Honours. We have proven how the CPK policies developed in this period and the role of these two accused, where they were located, what they were doing, and how they contributed to the decisions and policies of the party. The head of the crocodile has been exposed. Your Honours, I will turn very briefly uh, to some comments on the two force movements. My colleague, uh, Mr. Rayner, has covered this issue uh, thoroughly with you. And I would simply remind you that the Noon Jaya defense has narrowed down for you the issues that you must decide in regard to to Noon Chea's criminal responsibility. You heard from them, and I quote, Noon Chea does not deny his participation in the decision to evacuate Phnom Penh. He readily concedes that he knew about it, agreed to it, and approved of it. And you also heard another important admission from their team that same day. They said, and I again quote, Noon Chea does not try to hide for one minute that the population of Phnom Penh would have been moved into cooperatives whether or not a food crisis existed. End of quote. Your Honours, as my colleague has explained, these are important admissions. The Noon Che defense no longer contends that either the threat of American bombing or food shortages in the city was the reason for the permanent displacement of the population of Phnom Penh. The issue before you, which my colleague has very well responded to, is a limited one. Can the defense justify the forced transfer of the entire urban population of Cambodia, millions of people, in order to implement an economic policy? The answer to that, Your Honours, under international law, is clearly no. One issue that the defense uh, neglected to address in their arguments is the primary reason that we contend Noon Chea is criminally liable for extermination and murder in relation to the first force movement. You will remember when I questioned Noon Chea at the start of this trial, he admitted that the CPK, CPK leaders made a conscious decision that all people, all people were to be required to leave the city, including the elderly, the sick, and the hospital patients. You may remember the rather dismissive answer he gave when I asked him whether they took into account the number of people who were in hospitals at the time. Your Honours, Noon Chea and Q Sampan knew when they decided to forcibly evict from the city the entire population, no exceptions, that the most vulnerable of those people, that thousands of them would die. And to make matters worse, they sent them out of the city into the countryside based on a lie that they were only temporary leaving, temporarily leaving for three days, so they should not bring possessions with them. So many people, to make matters worse, left food behind and brought money instead. Your Honours, Noon Chea and Kusum Pan are criminally responsible for the deaths that ensued as a result of these decisions.
I will also be brief today in regards to the second force transfer. Noon Chea, as I just indicated, admits that he participated in and agreed with the party's plan to forcibly displace the urban population of Cambodia out of cities and towns and into cooperatives. The second force transfer was a continuation of that same joint criminal enterprise, something that Noon Che admits that he contributed to, knew about, and agreed with. He bears criminal responsibility for his participation in that JCE, whether or not he went on the standing committee's August 1975 trip to the Northwest Zone, and whether or not he knew of all the details of the second force movement. And let me add a few words about the charge of extermination relating to the second force transfer. I would remind your honors that the CPK leaders made a knowing decision to send another 500,000 people into a zone that they already knew did not have enough food to feed the existing evacuees. That is shown by the documents that are before you. The August 1975 minutes, the September 1975 policy documents. So it is no wonder that the Q Sempan defense doesn't want you to hear any evidence as to what happened to those people after they arrived at their location. Your Honours, of course you are entitled to look at the consequences of this forced movement. You've heard from the witnesses how they arrived in areas that had no food, of the ensuing deaths of their loved ones. And yet the accused say there is no evidence of death on a massive scale. I would refer your honors and the accused to one very important document on this issue. It is a contemporaneous report from the regime from Sector 5 of the Northwest Zone, E3 slash 1181. There is a lot of inf interesting information about the fate of the evacuees in this document. Let me just direct you to one very important part. The report describes how a total of 70,000 70, new people had been moved into one district alone in the Northwest. And these are the words of the CPK cadre who wrote this report. He said about this district, and I quote, it was the worst place of starvation, and 20,000 people died in that district in 1976 alone. 70,000 people sent there, 20,000 died in 1976. That, Your Honours, is death on a massive scale. Your Honours, the Noon Chea defense have spent considerable time in their closing submissions, contesting the existence of a policy targeting Khmer Republic officials and soldiers, and Noon Chea's responsibility for the executions at Tupul Trade. My colleague has addressed some of their arguments. Because of the time they have spent on this issue, let me add a few more observations on why what you heard from the defense does not withstand scrutiny. Our friend, Mr. Kope, spent all of Monday morning last week presenting to you an eloquently delivered thesis on why evidence regarding killings of law and law personnel around the country in 1975 did not prove anything. 
And before I turn to his thesis, let me note, Your Honors, that in his entire submission, Mr. Kope did not respond at all, not a single word, to the principal basis on which the co-prosecutors contend that Nguyen Chea is criminally, criminally responsible for these executions. That basis is his participation in a broad joint criminal enterprise or common criminal plan that sought to identify and eliminate persons who were class enemies or politically opposed to the CPK. Instead of responding to the basis that we contend Mr. responsible, the defense set out to disprove something we do not contend, that there was a policy in, in place immediately on April 1975 to kill all persons, all persons who had been officials or soldiers of the Khmer Republic. Your Honors, we were challenged by the defense to do this, so I want to be very clear as to what the process prosecution submits the evidence as proven before you. One, that officials, soldiers, and police from the former regime were identified in revolutionary flag and party circulars as class enemies. Two, that in February 1975, the CPK leaders decided and publicly announced that the top leaders of the Khmer Republic would be subject to immediate execution. Third, that between the 17th and 20th of April 1975, as admitted by Standing Committee member Ng Sari, the CPK, CPK leaders decided to expand the scope of executions to other high-ranking officials and soldiers, which led to the mass killings at Tulbultray and other sites throughout the country. And fourth, Your Honors, fourth, for the remainder of the DK regime, the Khmer Republic officials and soldiers who were not killed in 1975 were targeted as enemies, closely monitored, frequently subject to arrest, detention, and killed if they did not refashion themselves. That is the position of the prosecutors, Your Honors, and last week, we saw Mr. Kope put forward a theory to you that executions of Khmer Republic personnel were mostly concentrated in a few zones, and therefore there was no nationwide policy from the center. On such Let me give you a few reasons why this argument is incorrect. First, Your Honors, Khmer Republic soldiers and officials were not equally spread out among the entire country on the 17th of April, 1975. There were many regions of Cambodia that were entirely controlled by the Khmer Rouge long before April 1975, for example, the the fact that there were some areas of the country where there were fewer or no killings of Khmer Republic personnel is because the government of force, forces and officials had already left those areas well before. And conversely, there were other parts of the country where law and law forces were more prevalent. One of those was the Northwest Zone. My source for this your honors, is none other than Michael Victory, an expert who the Nguyen Che defense accepts as reliable and not biased, someone who they told you in their closing arguments has closely examined what they call the standard held views about the executions of the Khmer Rouge. Victory describes the Northwest Zone, and I quote, as the last pro-law-law bastion outside of Phnom Penh, end quote. 
control and no your honor the entire thesis of the defense that you heard on monday was based on a flawed premise the fact that there were more executions of Khmer Republic officials and soldiers in some areas than others does not mean there was not a common policy. It means there was more Khmer Republic officials and soldiers in certain regions of the country. The second flaw in the argument you heard from the defense is that you were asked to simply ignore the killings that took place in the northwest and southwest zones, based on the assumption that these zones were not carrying out the plans of the center. There is no truth to this assumption, Your Honors. Tamak and Rutnim were part of the upper leadership of the party. They were doing what had been collectively decided by the party leaders. I will discuss Nim and the Northwest Zone later. But in regards to the Southwest Zone, you heard Noon Chea himself testify in this trial that Trangkak District, the home of Tamak, was one of the two core party bases in the entire country. You heard from the former secretary of Trangkak District, Petsch Chim. He described how the district was awarded the honorary red flag and recognized by the Central Committee in 1977 as one of three model districts in democratic Kampuchea. And let me again cite the words of Michael Vickery, whose word the defense is willing to accept. Michael Vickery describes the Southwest Zone, and I quote, as the Pol Pot Zone par excellence. He also refers to it as the microcosm of Pol Pot policy as it was apparently envisioned by its originators. It is highly disingenuous, Your Honors, to suggest that Tamak was acting contrary to the wishes of Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia. We've heard a story of zones being clashing with each other throughout the democratic period. You are asked to believe by the defense that when other zones were purged, that it was Tamak and the Southwest Zone that decided to do this themselves. And I would refer you here simply to the statement of Kai Pak, the Secretary of the North Zone, he provided a statement that tells us exactly who decided to institute the purge of his zone in early 1977. Pol Pot and Noon Chea. Michael Vickery does not agree with the defense either. In his words, the Southwest was used by Phnom Penh to carry out purges elsewhere. So, Your Honors, the evidence of these killings in the Southwest Zone and the Northwest Zone proved the policy because these zones were very much in step with the leaders in Phnom Penh. The third flaw in the argument you heard from Mr. Kobe is that it is simply incorrect that there were no executions of Khmer Republic officials and soldiers in zones outside the Northwest and Southwest. We have introduced to you extensive evidence of these killings, but the defense does not like our evidence. So let me one more time refer them to a source that they accept, the research of Michael Vickery. In regards to the North Zone, the North Zone, which the defense submitted to you on Monday, there were no executions until, he says, the Southwest Zoot 
Southwest Line troops arrived in 1977. Michael Vickery begs to differ. He wrote, and I quote, Northern troops were told that all law and all officers from the rank of lieutenant were to be killed along with all important civilian officials. He also wrote that in the initial years of the regime, 1975 to 1976, killing was restricted to Republican soldiers and high officials. With respect to the East Zone, Mr. Victory states, quote, there was much killing in 1975 of law and no military and high officials. And with respect to Crutchy, Sector 105, Vickery writes, quote, at the very beginning, law and no officers had been executed, but thereafter, there were very few killings. In the end, Your Honors, Michael Vickery does not support the arguments you heard from the defense. He has questioned the conclusions of other authors. But merely to show that there was no policy to kill all, and I repeat, to kill all law and officers and soldiers. And it is certainly true that the evidence you have seen shows that certain law and officers were dispersed into the countryside, into the that does not mean that there was not a policy to kill officers of a certain rank and above. And that is the position of the prosecution. I'd like to turn now to uh, spend a little time on the relationship between the leaders in Phnom Penh and the Northwest Zone, in particular Zone Secretary Ruth Neem. The accused have argued that they are not responsible for the killings of law and law soldiers in the Northwest because zones were autonomous and the center did not have authority over the zone And the defense called the Northwest Zone, Northwest Zone Secretary Neem, and I quote, an extremely harsh and cruel zone leader whose conduct seriously deviated from Pol Pot and Neem Chae's intentions. Your Honors, let me take you through what the evidence on this issue actually proves. First, the evidence shows that the party center issued orders to the Northwest Zone even in the period prior to 1975. And I refer, refer here, you here to uh, evidence regarding the 1967 uh, Peasants' Rebellion in Samlok that you have heard of. And you may recall that in the uh, September 1977 issue of Revolutionary Flag, Pol Pot indicated, and I quote, the party central committee had not yet decided to open fire throughout the country, but bottom bomb exploded first. The party was in the lead, and in 19, 1967, the party decided that bottom bong in the northwest zone had to temporarily, temporarily suspend the armed struggle in bottom bong so that the whole country could equally complete preparations to attack, end of quote. Your Honours, you have evidence before you as to who conveyed the instruction from the party center. In one of his video-recorded interviews discussing the Samlok uprising, Kyusampan himself explains how the party center exercised its authority over the Northwest Zone. Kyusampan stated, and I quote, it was Mr. Noon Chea who conveyed a directive from the standing committee to Mr. Ruh and Mr. K to negotiate with the enemy. Your Honours, even as early as 1967, Noon Chea and the party center had authority and control over the Northwest Zone project. You've heard 
the defense challenged whether the Khmer Rouge had a centrally commanded organization as of April 1975. This Monday, the Sun Pen lawyers sought to portray the Khmer Rouge as a group of people who emerged barefoot from the jungle on the 17th of April, incapable of any organization. Your Honours, we have already discussed in detail the evidence that proves there was a centrally commanded structure in place well before April 1975. Forward command bases such as B-5, where Pol Pot, Nun Chea, and Kusun Han, and the zone leaders gathered during the final attack and evacuation on Phnom Penh. A fact that both of the accused have admitted. And you will recall the testimony of Padres who described the telegram and radio communication system that was in use during that time period. Testimony that is corroborated by photos, records, radio broadcasts, and instructions in the 1972 revolution. Your Honor, here is the difference between the prosecution and the defense. We ask you to rely on the evidence of the communication and command structures at the party headquarters. They ask you to reach conclusions based on the fact that some soldiers did not wear shoes. Your Honours, there is simply no question that the zone armies were part of a centrally commanded structure as of April 1975. And I want to take you uh, to a few uh, documents. Uh, the best evidence from which you can see that the Northwest Zone Army was part of a centrally commanded structure is in the funk radio broadcasts from the period that regularly reported on the status of various battlefronts. Those reports included detailed information about the West Where did that information come from, You've heard from the witnesses, people like Norn Safang and Kim Bun, that each zone regularly sent telegrams to the party headquarters reporting on the battle situation and that those reports were then used in the funk radio broadcasts that were, that were broadcast on the radio. If I can show you now uh, one of those radio broadcasts that proves that the Northwest is very much part of a centrally commanded army. Your Honours, the slide, the document that I would like to show you now is a radio broadcast from the 20th of February 1975 from the voice of Bunk. It's a report that describes the capture and destruction of the town of Mong in Baton Bong by resistance forces. It reads, Mong Township is completely leveled. Our people throughout the country congratulate and convey warm wishes to the victorious CPNLA units on the Hmong Badenbong battlefront. According to initial reports from this front, our CPNLAF completely leveled the Hmong business district. We killed or captured almost all the enemy, seized a large quantity of weapons and materials, and liberated hundreds of thousands from the traders' yokes. Your Honor, there are many funk broadcasts that, like this report, convey information from the West. And this proves, this proves that North West forces, like the other zone armies, reported in the party center headquarters, and they were reported in the period before and during April 1975. This relationship, Your Honours, between the party center and the leaders, uh, the leader of the Northwest Secretary Zone, 
has been the subject of witness testimony before you. You heard from T. Pond, who described trips of the leaders to the zones in the pre-75 period, including a trip Nguyen Trae to San Lot. You heard from Nguyen Trae's bodyguard that during the BK period, Nguyen Trae went to Batam Bang every three or four months to meet with Nim. And that Nim would come to Phnom Penh for meetings for periods of 10 to 15 days. Your Honours, what did Nguyen Chea talk about during his regular meetings with the Northwest Zone Secretary? We know one subject they discussed. Because Nguyen Chea admitted to Tet Sambat that he learned from Zone Secretary Nim of the arrest and execution of his uncle, Su Heng. You'll remember that Su Heng was the former leader of the Cambodian Communist Party who had defected to the Sino government and later became a major in the Law No Army. Zone Secretary Nim told Nguyen Chea that he had arrested and killed Su Heng and that he had arrested and killed Su Heng's son Nguyen Are we to believe that Nguyen was told of the executions of his own relatives, yet at the same time he concealed from Nguyen the executions of other Khmer Republic officials and soldiers? Mr. Kope played for you again the film of Tet Sambat's interview in which Nguyen claims that he did not become aware of the mass executions of Lono soldiers until after 1979. Another reason, Your Honours, we know, we know that this is not true is because the subject of these executions was widely reported by the international media in 1975 and 1976. We have put this evidence before you. Reports from Reuters, AFP, New York Times, statements by the White House, matters these CTP leaders were well aware of and reported, responded to in the media. You have heard the evidence of how the leaders the international news. They were very well aware of reports of atrocities the Northwest We also know from the telegrams and reports that Zone Secretary sent to the center that he did not conceal the arrests or executions of soldiers from the Khmer Republic. And if I may show you a document let me show you one of those reports. Your Honours, this is the monthly report for the Northwest Zone from May 1977. And the part, it states, quote, in Region 3, there appears to have been some sort of problems like laziness to work, escaping the duty to labor, pretended illnesses, pretended dumb and crazy people, conjugal disputes, and moral offenses among married men and women. Furthermore, there still exists private ownership. Continuing on later in the same paragraph, as we have observed, these acts actually arose from among veteran soldiers and those with the ranks of second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain, and major who hide themselves in collectives and whom we have never found. Recently, their acts have shown up clearly. We have already taken steps and arrested all of them. Your Honours, telegrams and reports from the Northwest Zone are also at odds with the defence assertion that the Zone acted autonomously based on its own discretion and contrary to the policies of the centre. Let me show you quickly a series of documents that prove this. On August 12, 1977, Telegram, Zone Secretary Nim states, 
about building a dam in Stung Sang Kai. Comrade Van has consulted with me whether to let them do it. It is up to the Ban Next, a report sent by name to Ankar on the 17th of May, ដូច្នេះអ្វីដែលអង្គការជាអ្នកសម្ដេចនោះសូមធ្វើដើម្បីនោះនៅក្នុងថ្ងៃទី <coughs> 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 <cough
that he needed to be more vigilant and more aggressive against enemies. His failure in the eyes of the center was not that he had killed too many, but that he had not killed enough. Let me look at one other aspect of this telegram, Your Honors, while we have it before you. And that is regarding the nature of the enemy activities that he was told to be more vigilant against, in particular the reference to secret moving. Memes report states the enemies led and encouraged people to flee away. However, when they tried to escape away with 40 people, we smashed all of them. A week later, Your Honors, Neem reported to the center that another 60 people had tried to escape to Thailand in sectors 1 and 4, but we smashed 58 of them, so just two were able to escape. And he had made similar reports to the center the previous year. This is from the May 1977 report. In Region 5, nine enemies, six males and three females, fled into the forest. They were the ones who escaped from the collective, and we investigated we met them once they were taking the arrest and fired at them. We are still in pursuit of them. Besides, there was a movement of people fleeing to Thailand, but the number of escapers compared to last month is much less, with most of them smashed by us. This is something we see, Your Honors, in the telegrams and reports from all zones and sectors. People fled in cooperatives were considered enemies. In the country, that Yun Che and Q Sapan built. If you tried to escape, you were hunted down and killed. The defense may not like it, but we have called this what it is, a slave state. We have never argued that collectivization itself is illegal. But when it is forced onto the people by violence, when the individual becomes solely a tool of the state, and when those who try to flee or escape, the collective are arrested and killed, is there any doubt that the people are not free, that they have become slaves of Ankar? This issue is relevant to this trial, Your Honors, because it proves that the purpose of the forced transfers was on and off. The enslavement of the Vacuumese in cooperatives was part and parcel of the JCE alleged by the case to close the order. And that is why, at the very start of this trial, the chamber made clear to all parties that evidence relating to the policy of cooperatives is admissible. Noon Chae has asked that we not forget the head and tail of the crocodile, that we take into consideration the reason the population was moved to cooperatives. That is exactly what we've done, Your Honors. There can be no question there can be no doubt that the party center had the authority to stop these killings. They had the authority to punish or discipline known cadres who were involved in these events if they wanted to. You will recall in the one day of Poche video clip that Mr. Kobe played. Noon Che does not dispute that he had authority to take action. These were his words in that video. Quote, if I had known then, we would have taken preventive measures. Noon Chea was the deputy secretary of the party. He had assigned responsibility for party affairs, including the appointment and discipline of cadres. And if there's any question, Your Honors, about the authority, the ultimate authority between the center and the zones, the answer can also be seen in the records of S21. Thousands of zone cadres, including five zone secretaries, 
arrested, interrogated, and executed at his own but instead of punishing um, Zone Secretary Nim after the executions at Tool Poultry, Nim, Nim was rewarded. He was promoted to a position on the Standing Committee, and he remained Zone Secretary for the next three years. We would submit this is standard operating procedure for the CPK leadership. Promoters who kill the enemy your honors, the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the executions at Tool Poultry were part of a common criminal plan to identify and eliminate enemies and that the accused bear superior responsibility for the crimes committed by his own cadres. If this is appropriate, um, um, I have uh, a few more minutes, but then I will pass the floor to my colleagues. Uh, 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 Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, sorry, it may not have been translated well. Uh, I have another five minutes. minutes. I can either continue oh, or, or we can take a break now. And I can finish after the break and then turn, turn the floor to, to my, my colleagues. Your Honor, I have a few minutes. I can either continue or we can take a break now. And I can finish after the break and then turn the floor to my colleagues. Your Honor, I have a few minutes. I can either continue or we can take a break now. And I can finish after the break and then turn the floor to my colleagues. So, I'm changing culture.